I'm uh, here to tell you about how to use technology to extend your life and achieve immortality. Sorry, that's Brian Johnson. Um, I'm here to tell you about stable coins. Um, I sat on this roughly the same stage a year ago and uh, talked about how I felt like stable coins were achieving an inflection point. And that's happened. Uh, we have the data to prove it. We didn't before, we do now. Uh, and specifically, what I'm here to tell you about is how stable coins are penetrating in emerging markets and potentially causing significant geopolitical outcomes, influencing the monetary policy of these nations, and causing significant benefits to end users, to savers, to consumers in these places. So since I was here a year ago, this is going to be a very data-heavy presentation. I'll publish the slides later. Since I was here a year ago, the supply of stable coins has grown from 127 billion to 171 billion as of today. Uh, so we've had significant growth, not as explosive as in 2021, but still very material. Um, and there have been some new entrants there. Uh, Athena has launched an interest-bearing stablecoin. They've taken market share. But really, it's a Tether story. Tether continues to dominate. They're about 70% of the market. And maybe more interestingly, I love this chart because it's just up and to the right constantly. It's linear. This is uh, active monthly sending addresses on blockchains. Uh, you can see it's just always growing. So it's over 20 million now. So over 20 million addresses on chain every month will send a stablecoin transaction. This chart includes every major blockchain where stablecoin transactions happen, every major L2. And uh, Tron is the number one. Uh, I think a lot of people know that. Uh, Ethereum uh, is up there. Ethereum L2s are gaining market share. Uh, B BSC is actually pretty uh, prominent. Now, keep in mind, this doesn't mean that there's 20 million individuals that are making stablecoin transactions. Uh, we don't know exactly what the ratio of real humans to blockchain addresses is, but this is a very demonstrative chart of the continued growth we see in the stablecoin sector. And importantly, we see that it grows regardless of the crypto market cycle, right? So everything, every metric in crypto trended down from between 22 and 23, but this kept growing. So this is a very important data point which shows us stable coins have achieved some kind of real adoption outside in the real world, not just in crypto, right? So this is the critique I always hear from central bankers, from haters, from no coiners, right? Oh, crypto people are just using stable coins to transact on exchanges. It's just traders. That's not true, right? There are ordinary people using stable coins to make their lives better. And the growth of stable coins throughout the market cycle is indicative of that. So uh, this is a very important metric as well. This is dollar settlement value. So this is all of the dollars settled on blockchains in stablecoin format. This data is enormously difficult to determine because you have to do a huge amount of denoising. Uh, you have to net out MEV, net out inter-exchange transactions, and it's an estimate, right? And in the past, I actually had a more aggressive estimate for this. I thought it was around $10 trillion a year. My new estimate is around $5 trillion a year. Uh, so I'm a little bit more conservative. But the point is, stablecoins are settling huge amounts of value by any measure. Uh, Tron is actually the number one, uh, followed by Ethereum. And if you take that same data I just showed you and you compare it to all of the value settled with native crypto assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin's in orange here, Ethereum's in purple, other uh, L1s are in uh, light purple, stablecoins are in blue. You see that blockchains are mostly about sending dollars, uh, mainly dollars. Stable coins, but mainly dollars. And it's, in the past, it's been as high as 70%. And right now, it's around 50%. So over time, dollars have just kind of invaded blockchains and come to really dominate the flows. Uh, and so if you compare this to the percentage of stable coins that are backed by dollars, it's about 99%. Uh, there's some gold, there's some euros, but really not a lot of other sovereign currencies. This is a sign that crypto is good for the dollar, right? Uh, you often hear Bitcoin people say, oh, you know, we're going to destroy the dollar. Uh, blockchains are bad for the dollar. We're going to destroy all the fiat currencies. It's the opposite. Public blockchains extend the reach of the dollar worldwide. 
maybe in the future it'll be other FX, right? It doesn't have to be the dollar, but clearly people prefer to use sovereign currencies on blockchains, and this is very visible in the data. We just have to acknowledge it as a reality. Crypto is good, not bad for the dollar. Don't forget that. And if you compare how dollarized stablecoins are to other major financial networks globally, savings devices globally, it's very stark, right? So foreign exchange reserves, dollars about 55%. International trade flows, all these metrics are in the kind of 50 to 60%. The dollar is the global reserve, but it's not overwhelmingly so, right? Uh, for the foreign exchange transactions, that adds up to 200, so keep that in mind. For stablecoins, again, it's 99%. So it's very stark, I think. And of course, stablecoins are new. They've only really been around for five years or so. It could change. As of right now, this is what I, when I talk to policymakers in Washington, I say, look at how dollarized stablecoins are. Uh, I think it's very, very clear. So as I said before, stablecoins have decoupled from the crypto market cycle. In green on the right axis, that's transaction that's the aggregate amount of trans transaction value settled on stable coins. And then on the left-hand side, that's crypto exchange spot volumes. You see it came down dramatically in 22, 23, but stable coin usage went up. So something is happening with stable coins that has nothing to do with crypto trading. What is that? Who are these people using stable coins? I set out to find out. So I commissioned a study this year. I just published it last week. We hired YouGov, one of the best pollsters, to go to five key emerging market countries, Brazil, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. These are all places with high crypto adoption. And we asked crypto users in these countries, what are they doing with stable coins? And no one's ever done anything like that before. Nobody knew. We, saw, we had all the on-chain data, but we didn't know, what are these people actually doing with stable coins? Are they just trading? Are they buying NFTs? Or are they doing uh, ordinary financial transactions? And uh, as it turns out, that's what they're doing, right? The number one thing they do, 50%, and I'll get into this in a minute, is getting access to the crypto economy. But just behind that is saving money in dollars. And in most of these countries, getting dollar banking is very hard. These are countries, for the most part, with high inflation, uh, with relatively weak property rights. And what we saw was a majority of all of the individuals surveyed have converted their local currency into a stable coin. But interestingly, they have very different reasons for why they like stable coins, right? So in Nigeria, um, it's to save in dollars. That's their primary stable coin goal. In Turkey, the primary goal was to earn a yield, right? In Indonesia, it was efficient currency conversion. So it's not the same exact reason in all these countries why they like to use stable coins. So this is sort of the most important finding from the survey. What are your primary goals? The number one goal was access to the crypto economy. That makes sense. These are crypto in users that we surveyed. The number, one, number two goal was saving money in dollars. So there is a kind of crypto dollarization happening in these places. And then there's a whole other panoply of things that they're doing. They're earning a yield. You can, some stable coins are natively interest bearing. Others, you put them into DeFi pool and you earn a yield that way. Um, they are taking their finances into their own hands. In some cases, they're buying goods and services with, sta with stable coins. Some cases, they're sending money internationally. So they're doing all sorts of things. And we have now the data to prove it. The important thing is that stablecoins are part of these users' everyday financial lives. We asked them, which of these things have you done at least once? 70% have converted their currency to a stablecoin. 39% have paid for something with a stablecoin. 38% have sent or received money to a relative in a different country with stablecoins. Uh, some of them are using it for their business. Some of them are doing payroll. So, I think this is very critical data. You know, we need to understand stablecoins have crossed the chasm into being a mainstream financial technology, an important part of these people's lives. They're not just trading crypto. And the usage is growing overwhelmingly in every country we talk to, in particular Nigeria, and we're going to focus on Nigeria in a minute here, the usage is growing. So on the left side, you have uh, this year's usage, whether it increased or decreased, on the more pale colors, you have next year's expected increase. And you just see in every single country, they increase their usage in the past year, and they plan to further increase their usage in the next year. And of the five countries, Nigeria was number one, followed by India. So the drivers of adoption, though, depend on the specific context in these countries, right? So on the left here, we have the real yield. So that's 
short dated government security yield minus inflation rate. And in Turkey, it's very negative because they have high inflation. In Nigeria, it's very negative. And this kind of makes sense. 55% of the Turkish users we surveyed said they're chasing yield. That's why they use stable coins. And it makes sense. Uh, government, uh, short dated government debt instruments are not yielding uh, anything useful for them. So the dollar having a positive real yield is, is useful. And then on the right here, we have the average inflation rate over the last 10 years in these countries. And in Turkey, they're going through an advanced inflation episode right now. Same in Nigeria. And in Brazil, there have been hyperinflation episodes in living memory, so people will remember that. And uh, you, know, you can see how that also influences people's propensity to use stable coins. So another thing we wanted to understand was, why is Tether so dominant as the stable coin of choice in emerging markets? And make no mistake, Tether is number one. And you, know, you might be a little surprised by that if you read the mainstream media in the US. You, know, you read the Wall Street Journal, they're always saying how Tether is garbage, how it's under-reserved, the accounting is shady, uh, you know, it's used for all sorts of bad things. The truth is, we went and we asked these people, you know, ordinary people in these five emerging market countries, why do you like Tether? What scares you about Tether? Would you consider using something else? And as it turns out, they don't care about the, what the Wall Street Journal has to say, believe it or not. Um, they <laughs> care about liquidity. They care about network effects. They care about reliability, track record, Lindy. So the number one reason is because it's the most popular stablecoin in their network. It has this advantage. It's been around for the longest time. It's been fairly stable throughout that period. And it's just very entrenched at this point. So I think this really demonstrates the difference between perception and reality. People care about the pragmatic qualities that allow them to save uh, and you know, protect their own financial interests. They don't necessarily care about what the Western media has to say. So we have some more data feeds. These are not from my study. This is other data that I found that also shows continual growth of stable coins in the real economy. Actually, this chart on the left is Singapore data uh, from Chainalysis showing stablecoin payments just growing quarter over quarter over quarter. And on the right here, we have Brazilian tax data. As it turns out, Brazil asks taxpayers to share information regarding their stablecoin usage. So this is uh, reported tether usage for payments in Brazil. And you can see it's just up and to the right. It's growing constantly. So we are in this kind of inflection period of very steady and strong growth, particularly in emerging markets. Now, I want to focus on one country in particular, which is Nigeria. Every single question we asked in the survey, Nigeria was the number one. Nigerians have the highest favorability for stable coins. That's this data here. They have the highest portfolio penetration of stable coins. They use stable coins the most frequently. Nigerians are obsessed with stable coins, and it kind of makes sense. Uh, Nigeria has high inflation. You can get a dollar-based bank account in Nigeria, presumably if you're a bit more affluent, but there are capital controls associated with those dollar accounts. And ultimately, that dollar is a liability of a local bank, which you may not trust. By contrast, a stablecoin liability is a very credible liability. If you're facing off against Circle or PYUSD, Paxos, you can be pretty sure that the assets are there that are backing those stablecoins issued. Uh, and so that's a more credible claim on a dollar asset. So even though you may have access to dollar banking, you probably still prefer stable coins. So it's my conclusion looking at all this data, and I encourage you to look into the study as well. Um, it's on my website, castleisland.vc. Um, Nigeria is going through a crypto dollarization episode. So you may wonder what that term means. It's pretty self explanatory. It's a dollarization event with crypto, right? Uh, so because Crypto liquidity is so widespread because you can hold coins in a non-custodial way, because peer-to-peer -peer exchanges exist. Crypto infrastructure is just available on your smartphone. It's very hard to stop. Governments are not necessarily able to stop savers when they are wanting to dollarize, when they want to convert their savings from the local currency into a stable coin. That's not something that governments can easily inhibit. And in the past, there have been dollarization episodes. There's Ecuador, there is El Salvador. Uh, you have port, you know, fractional dollarization episodes in places like Argentina. But those were with, in many cases, physical dollars, physical banknotes, right? That's much harder to spread throughout the population. Stablecoins can very easily be distributed throughout the population. 
So my thesis is there's something different about stablecoins that means the dollarization episodes are more aggressive and they're harder to stop. And of course, the Nigerian government's not so happy about this stablecoin crypto adoption in their country. They put a Binance executive in jail, still in jail. They cut off banks from uh, allowing exchange, crypto exchanges to access them. It's causing serious frictions, but it is happening anyway. So I wanted to go a little bit further based on this data and try and make a guess of what other countries might be likely to experience a crypto dollarization episode. So this chart takes a little bit of explaining, so please bear with me. I went ahead and picked six variables that I think correlate with a propensity to adopt stable coins, a crypto propensity index. These variables are property rights, inflation, smartphone penetration, the cost of remittances, and then general crypto adoption. And so if you have weak property rights, high inflation, high smartphone penetration, expensive remittances, and high crypto adoption, I would say you have a high propensity to adopt crypto. So I took all those variables, I put them into quintiles, uh, which we don't have to dig into that, and I created an index score of the country's likelihood to experience dollarization, crypto dollarization. And of the ones on my list, the ones that are most likely were Nigeria, which is validating, that kind of validates my model, Argentina, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Angola, Egypt, Pakistan, and Brazil. So I dug into these countries, and they have some common themes. So they tend to have very high inflation or hyperinflation. They tend to be excluded from the global financial system, so remittances are expensive. The cost of moving money in and out of the country is high. Institutional trust in these countries is weak. Property rights in these countries is weak. The penetration of financial accounts, according to World Bank data, is weak. Crypto adoption is generally high, with the exception of Zimbabwe and Angola. And importantly, these are places that have capital controls. Uh, almost all of them do, with the exception of Brazil. So uh, if I had to make a guess as to what the next Nigeria would be, the next emerging market country to experience some kind of crypto dollarization event, I would say probably one of these countries. So uh, stay tuned. Maybe next year I'll come back and give another talk and I'll say it happened. Uh, I think it's likely to happen in the next decade. It's not going to be overnight. So I, you know, one last question is, well, Nick, are you being neo-colonial in your talk here, you know, should we be excited about dollars penetrating some of these markets? Is that a good thing? And I would say yes, I actually do think it's good, right? So uh, in, in previous episodes of dollarization, uh, in Ecuador in uh, 2000 or in El Salvador in early 2000, dollarization, which is the government changing the official currency from an inflationary local currency to the dollar, has significantly brought down inflation rates, right? Significantly, they achieve macroeconomic uh, stability in, the, in these instances. And it, you know, we see spontaneous dollarization happening at the population level in many cases. These are individual savers taking their financial lives into their own hands, opting out of an inflationary local currency, opting into a different, stronger currency. And I would say there's other ancillary benefits to stablecoin adoption in some of these countries, which is better financial integration, being able to engage in trade, import and export, cross-border payments, without the frictions that are associated with the banking system. And the further away you get from the nexus of global finance, whether that's Hong Kong, London, or New York, the further away you get, the more expensive finance is. And that is a drag on the economies of these places. So I think when you introduce something like stable coins, which is a flat, fair, equitable, global payments mechanism, you reduce that drag, you increase commerce, you increase the ability of these people to earn in an asset that is stable and sound. And generally, I believe that would correlate with GDP growth. So even though the governments may not like the loss of monetary discretion, in many cases, you see them capitulate. When their citizens lead, they eventually follow. So it may be a bit controversial to be touting dollarization, but the fact is, we have crypto infrastructure, we have blockchains, we have wallets, it's going to happen. We've seen these episodes happening now. We have evidence of that, and I think it's going to keep happening. I'm going to wrap it up there. Thanks so much for your time.